Good morning. This may sound like an overwrotten, overcomplicated title, because you cannot explain everything in San Pao in just uh, 30 minutes. So I would encourage you, if you have not yet, to have a guided tour like the one we've had here, even if you want to know more about the hospital grounds. And you cannot know about the whole 10 years that the full restoration of the buildings in the grounds were, uh, took place done by over 70 teams of architects, including Chavi Guitar here. So I will just focus on a very specific things, which is the restoration of the vaults. Let me go first in this picture that shows the hospital grounds. And you, I would encourage you also to look upwards because if you have seen in the previous presentation, the Menex in Montanais architecture has these, has these uh, richness that you can see in the skin, and that's way beyond that. And this is a picture of the project delivered by Domenico Montané with such a delicious case in this box. And in the report, other than the explanation of how the hospital works, its history, Pau Gilles and his legacy, there is a fragment speaking, a section speaking about the buildings he has looked into before going into the hospital. And he starts with Antwerp, and he then details the different cities where there are hospitals that he has looked at. So, his international benchmarks or references. He l how many? Like 240. That's quite something all over the world. Most of them in Germany, the UK and France. I will not go through all of them. And what does he do to study, to research them? These are some of, his, some of his handwritten files kept at the Association of Architects, where we have the legacy that was granted by their states. And you can see the hospital and then some the names, Rupel, Kund, Evalva, and a small numbering, that being the page. So what page would that be? That are the literature, the bibliographic references, and most of these is also kept at the Association of Architects. And if you looked into the bibliographic references, you can see that there are a lot of documentation on these 600 books that have to do on hospitals at the time. Here, for instance, on people that have researched into what's considered to be a modern hospital back in the days and what is required according to contemporary medicine. And they all look into these hospitals that he wrote down what he was interested in. And precisely looking into Kunz's books, we found a small sketch by Domenic himself uh, a sketch of what would seem like a layout of what a hospital should be. What is he researching? What is he writing down and explaining the project report? But the type of vehicle that should be used for the carrying of patients and the layout, the distributions. And if you, again, if you have not visited the hospital grounds, you can see that you can it was to be in, in different pavilions. Well, have you heard about social distancing? Well, back day, back then, people were already claiming that in order to prevent any contagions and infections, there would there should be a separation between these pavilions and how they were to be communicated. Well, with these underground passages, or through tunnels, as you can see here. And so it's not something that he is making up. He's researching into this. He's looking into what the doctors are saying and how he applies this. And in some of these hospitals, so this is the Perimata Hospital, by the way, like the previous work that he was researching into. And 
and you can see that the that would be the Sun Pao Hospital. It's not one of the biggest ones, but it's not one of the smaller ones either. It was quite ambitious back then for a city such as Barcelona. And in these books he reads, um, not just the, the ones he had been in other places, but it's not just the functioning part, but also the scientific part. Bear in mind that just after he graduated, he became a professor at the University at the School of Architecture, and he taught on the application of physical um, scientific and also on to architecture. And on this program, the, this handwritten program, he tells on the curriculum um, things that are of interest to him whether natural based light or artificial lighting and heating, for instance, things to be taken into consideration in his hospital and hygiene and ventilation, things that are so important in a hospital. How to implement these is not something that we are doing here, though Dominic Montenegro does it himself and the patient's rooms and the pavilions. And again, he's not coming up with anything new here. He's taking, he's drawing up on the examples elsewhere. As you can see here on these metal elements with the main corridor duly lit so that there are, uh, there is room enough for ventilation with covered ceilings. This is a case study on the United States where you can see quite, um, similar distribution, quite a similar layout, whereas in France they are covering this with a vault with a preset, a pre-built system. I will not go through it. And what Domenic does is he researches into this and he adapts this on what's required according to him for some power and this is what he comes up with. By looking at this picture after seeing the previous ones, the first thing you realize is the skin, because this is fully decorated and there is a wheel behind and Teresa Salad talks about the healing beauty, how this should be part of the therapy for the patients. But if you look into the height of this room, of this hall, that's quite a change um, based on what he had researched. And if you look into the literature he, as he assessed, and these are very technical elevations and blueprints. You can see this one in Le Mans, this is in the United States, the Johns Hopkins precisely. And as the Manic himself points out in his report, the height are from two to five meters, mostly because of the weather conditions there, because they need um, mostly heating during winter time and if it's too high then that will require further heating whereas in Tolet that's a different thing in France and that's eight meters and they start working on something that would really work well with the vault for traction. You can see that they all have these chimneys that Domenic was using in order to ventilate whereas Domenic would do peace. He came up with 14 meters. Now, let's do this straight. What patients need is this height and lighting will be brought through here with these filters, with these screens, the blinds will be. And you can open these top windows without the air current bothering, being hurting the patients. This is something that he tells uh, and that he really believes in, as we can see in his project, because he says that for the vaults in the major nursing rooms, there's been a research on a special a new structure. So, and he says, I don't like these metal ties. I don't like what this French approach has been here. And he says, I will do things differently. I will do the vaulted domes where 
that are used here in Catalonia. So in order to prevent these, and I will tell you now about these specific vault domes. This um, is known through different names, the Catalan vault, the timbral vault, the tile vault. Um, rather use this name, the timbral vault, or the voltafoglio, as it's known in Italy, for instance. Just quickly, and sorry if you already know about this, the vault is built through a very light element, which is just a brick. A very thin brick, which is placed in the sides and here with plaster, and acts as a fast thickener, and you place it on the sides, then you flatten this, holding it with your hand, and in just a few seconds it holds in there. You keep it for a few minutes and then you place another one. It's a very, very easy technique with no much complications and it's really economical. What's the origin? Even though some, claim, some name it the Catalan Vault, it is uncertain whether it originated in Catalonia. The, accordingly, the first example is seen in 1382 in Valencia, specifically as seen in a letter from King Peter III to uh, Saragossa and telling him, go and see what they're doing, these guys in Valencia, they are doing these with ceramic tiles, and then you could apply it elsewhere. And then in Barcelona, the first one to be reported, the well-documented, this one it's 1410, so some years later. This is the chapter room in the Pedralbas Monastery. And you can see the vault on top of it. And this is the extra doors, which is on Timbral Vault. And then, up until the 19th century, this technique was used throughout the Mediterranean Basin and some theories claim that this is only where the Aragonese Catalan crown was extended, but that's disputed. You can see this, the interior part of a vault in a church, but not only for, ch for churches or palaces, but in some other and buildings such as this farmhouse, the Catalan farmhouse, where the Catalan vault is in the basement or in the ground floor, usually. And this technique is further expanded. It's, so this technique that is already working, and even more so in Catalonia, I mean, like all stairs seen in the Champla district in Barcelona and most of the old towns. If you would look at it um, without the coating, you would see that this is the technique that's been used. These two thin um, bricks or the small vaults. Before that, we were seeing in the Hotel España presentation that if we go beyond that skin we would see that we here in these small vaults there are these two pieces of tiles how come that this is called catalan vault after seeing that it's been existing for 500 years and probably its origin lies not in catalonia according to gerona Morturel, published in 1910 we hear about these brick structures with tied iron and that is that this technique this traditional technique that has been used for 500 years yet somehow limited because any vault creates some horizontal thrusts because it thrusts onto the adjoining walls and how do you work around this with buttresses with flying buttresses but this is expensive and therefore is kept only for some buildings. Once you have industrial iron, you have just a simple element of iron and therefore this makes this technique extend. 
And in modernism time, and most major buildings are done with this type of techniques, I'm thinking about factories here, where these covered uh, roofs and ceilings are done with such, and it acquires a certain prestige so that it it disseminates and and is then known as a Catalan vault. Then some architects, for instance, go to Madrid and implement this very technique. And this iron to oppose the thrust. And there are two very clear examples. Uh, was speaking about factories. I will not go through Rafael Gustavino. They will require another whole seminar. He was a master builder developing this work with uh, combining the timbrel vault with iron and he ended up in the United States. He patented this technique and there are over a thousand buildings in the United States that we use this technique. This is another example with uh, these uh, spaces and John Torres here where he combines the iron and the vault. So now in the 20th into 21st century, how do we restore these vaults? And specifically on the administration building that we are now in and where I worked some years ago. So Again, it's by having teamwork, not just the restorers and the workers that were here, but also with the technical team. I think there were 30 people in the technical staff working in here. And we found the same thing. If you look into the Menex vaults, the decorative wealth is really spectacular. You can see the basement, the ground floor, the first floor, this is the one we're in right now, and the second floor. So almost all the vaults are different in their skin, often in shape as well. And we have kept the documents and there is quite a control, a check on everything that's being done and this has all been kept in the hospital archives. They have it all uh, in their holdings and you can browse through that. And some areas with the stones, with glass, with a stucco, with a mucarna vault. And how do we restore this? as has been told previously some other presentations with these techniques with the minimum intervention by injecting filler to the tiles that are adhering or by looking at the grouting and in looking at the mixing between the mortars and the pigments to see what's the right one to strip the paint in some areas where there was some additional painting but we realized that the original color was this one so this was stripped off in order to get back to the original color same with the stones in the ribs in some instances where this was painted in white and this one was not so this was all recovered and in some specific instances where some tiles were missing so we still have some craftspeople able to do this and a ceramic artist that was great and was able to do this and he would replicate all the tiles that were to be done but restoring the vaults is not only restoring its skin it's also the restoring the, or the maintenance of its structural function because it's part of its value and the building we are now in it has all be, it was all vaulted 145 and these vaults are vaults that we are stepping on and as we speak and that's why the restoration we are performing is not only material element or ceramic element it is also an architecture uh, restoration and how the according to the building code, what we are restoring 
uh, requires a usage and therefore it has to meet certain architectural standards and that was something that Domenech was well aware himself and so for instance you need to guarantee if there are too many people on the room it will not collapse you need to guarantee the weather comfort and so on and so forth and so we will be using three we were using three strategies and i will tell you about these um, before i conclude when we were use looking into the present calculations y you would see that it just could not stand but we were here how come it stands in the decide okay let's try for a weight varying uh, testing or stress test we did so by filling these barrels with water and then we had these high precision, these high tech tools to monitor the, the forming and the, the pressure. And we saw how the vault would stand, but we could not be doing the 145 of stress weight bearing tests. And we asked for a team of architects in Girona to perform a test with dynamic testing. And a weight-bearing dynamic test means that you simply hammer uh, slightly the vault and you, by means of censoring, see how the wave um, travels. And by using this small hammer on uh, areas of the vault, you look at the bricks, uh, how they stand, the mortars, you see how it behaves, you analyze that, and I'm going through this very quickly, you computerize these, and if you see that this vault under these conditions with these many barrels of water can stand, all the others, since we extrapolate these based on this testing, they, we can see if they hold. But six of them, they were six that could not hold because of some cracks, and they were strengthened reinforced and second strategy was the creation of knowledge because I've been telling you about the significance of the timbrel vault in the case of Domenico Montanay and in this uh, hospital which had to abide to certain rules and regulations some vaults had to be brought down when I mean there were long uh, harsh debates but in order to meet the building code we had to bring them down for a fire staircase for instance or for some other conditions so what we did was try and build knowledge based on this and so when you for instance find about an archaeological site this is what you do so we call this um, museologic disassemblement and some of them were replaced were placed someplace else they have all been archived also so that if we want to rebuild one of these vaults uh, out of an educational focus we could do that not just the tiles but the whole geometry that requires these 3d rise and Afterwards, we said, okay, since we need to reinforce these vaults, instead of using a new system, such as concrete, would we'll go against this, let's see how they might behave. And we had a couple of testings done by placing a new tile sheet uh, with in one of the vaults. And then with another one, we tested some new materials, some mortars that reinforced with fibers, and we did some weight-bearing tests and they would work mostly the same. We eventually used the mortar, even though we could have used any of them. And the third strategy would be that, as suggested by Domenico Montenegro, we know the ones that hold, with the ones that not, and we have tested them, but what about the thrusts that need to be um, brought against this metal element? As we have seen in the Wastabin and Taurus, that these were exposed, it was uh, this uh, lama. It was hidden, and 
In the case of the Casa Fuste, as we did with the whole facade, it was really clean. And one thing that would look fine back then, it was not now. So how can we prove that the structure is right? What's, or how can we determine what's wrong with the metal, with the iron? Because in these vaults, there are these metal elements that are affecting the thrust. How can we determine the ones that are in right condition or not, whether they need restoration or not? And Domenic and his team had these sketches, these drawings of the structural elements in the in the buildings, and by recreating these in three D, and this is something that you cannot see in the ceiling of this very room we're in, that. We have this preventing the thrust so that the walls do not open up. And this is what we saw when we opened, and maybe something that you cannot appreciate in this sketch. This is what we had. And if you compare this to Domenic's drawings, there were the same number of bolts. Not always, but often as in the documented files. But, but are we to open this? Because sometimes we did just some probing and it was fine, but how can we guarantee that this would work and will not go or in some time? And then we use techniques as used in archaeology, such as the geolocation radar, and might not always work, but usually you have a sensor probing by means of a wave, and when bouncing, you get information of, of that. And since metal elements bound perfectly well, we knew that there was a metallic structure here and we would get this picture back. So whenever there is a rusted element, you would not get the wave bounds. And so if we had used this radar with this technique, um, we need to open and there is an issue, but the end, we are seeing here that there is no issue. So in some elements, we ended up opening these and by cleaning the rust layer, that was enough in some instances. In all this traditional scheme incorporated within the walls of San Paolo, you some roughly 600 meters of facade, only two meters were changed and even though there it was a very specific things because of water leaks and now to conclude and to summarize this is a quote by javier ramos uh, and santiago de compostela that i love where he speaks about given that the seminar is on restoration and how in historic buildings you really need to listen to them to understand them, how they were working, how they had been built, and to listen to them and to understanding them does not mean that we are doing nothing with them because we have seen how, for instance, you know, how in the Casanova's house you really have to tiptoe on it and not to be too aggressive, but in some other instances you need to come up with some intervention if you want to preserve its usage but first you need to do a thorough research and listen to the building thank you